sorry, sir. I'm trying to sort out some people. They're having issues logging in. That's okay. All right, sir. So I think we can start now. Okay. All right. So uh, before we start, I would like to just uh, briefly do uh, a, a very short introduction of our speaker. So my name is Armstrong Nicholas Bachi, and I'll be our moderator for today. Um, our speaker is uh, Mr. Benjamin Omerubi, and um, it's really an honor to have him here speak to us because for a couple of months i've been trying to look for people that would uh, help put us through in regards to the uh, training pathway for cardiothoracic surgery in the uk and uh, i was lucky enough to come across him via facebook and uh, he was enough to agree to speak to us today and um his portfolio I, every I, it's it's quite long for me to be uh, mentioning everything but uh everything is detailed on the poster and uh, if you went through the uh, his description in the poster you know that he's not uh someone you can easily come across so it's quite a privilege for us to have him speak to us in regards to this topic and offer us guidance on how to go about our our, our hospital and uh building our CV in regards to cardiothoracic uh, cardiothoracic training in the uk so um, you, you'll be having the floor now, sir, and uh, we look forward to gaining from you today, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here to speak to you guys. Um, if I may, might just understand the kind of audience we're dealing with today. If everyone could just say where they are in their training pathway or something. Just have an idea who is my audience. Okay, sir. Um, I, for them to speak, I would have to bring them uh, oh, stage. okay. That's how the platform works. But however, I know most of them. Okay. Uh, audience. So uh, we have uh, medical students from year two, three, four, five to six, final year medical students. And then we also have early career doctors from uh, house officers. We also have people that are doing NYC. Then we have people that are post PLAP 2. 
post plap too, okay? Yes, sir. And then we have FY2s, like a few FY2s. So okay. we cut across, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for that. I will just share a slide of mine and hopefully I will I'll talk for like maybe 20 minutes and we can share some discussions and questions if, I, if there are many. All right. That's fine, sir. Can everyone see my slides, if possible? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll give you a brief talk on, well, I'll call it the pathways to cardiothoracic surgery training in the UK. Um, every one of us have different pathways we've followed to get to where we are. Uh, it's never easy, it's, but it's, it's not impossible to put it that way. Uh, I will start by giving it give just like a small history of my own experience. So um, I would say I started training in cardiac surgery maybe about 12 years ago now. Uh, to in Nigeria as a registrar, you know, my rotation is to do general surgery. You start your senior post in cardiac surgery. After my turn in Nigeria, after cardiac surgery, I came to the UK to get more experience because sadly the experience we get in that's this part of West Africa and Africa is not enough to be a, if I say a day one world-class cardiac thoracic surgeon who can do all the variety of cases in the specialty, one of that skill that's in Nigeria training. So we need more. Even doing my training in Nigeria, I had to go to the country to India, to spend uh, over a year there to get experience. But in all the cases, you're still, never, you're still not good enough so I came to the UK to get more experience and I will share the pathways I believe in the UK for different people in different parts of their career. Uh, first slide here, just to talk about some of the, some of the big names in cardiac surgery, just to excite us about uh, those are people who have experienced cardiac surgery and know some of these faces. Uh, gentleman here uh, is a guy who people don't know about his name and it was an apprentice to this surgeon here and this cardiology lady here who developed the first uh, shunt to treat blue babies people who have sciatic heart disease he was a gentleman working in the lab who described the procedure in dogs but unfortunately when they went to the patient the day of the surgery in a real patient he was in the background just telling the, him what to do but however, his names were not in the book. His name is Vivian Thomas. Uh, this is the, the first heart transplant in Don, Christian Barnard. Uh, these are the two, one of the biggest names in cardiac surgery in the United States. Uh, Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey. As you see on the, net, the newsletter here, the bitter field. Uh, they had two of them, and they didn't go along too well with each other. But their disagreement tend to push the frontiers for cardiac surgery as they try to outdo themselves. And they quite brought a lot of cardiac surgery in their time. Sadly, they're both later now. So, what is cardiac thoracic surgery in the entirety? It's a it's a large group of things of uh, specialties. So you have cardiac surgery and you have thoracic surgery and you have cardiothoracic surgery. In some climes, people are involved in both. In the UK, you're going to train in both, but at the end of the end of your training, you have to specialize in each or one of them. So in cardiac surgery, what we do uh, is from aortic surgeries to we call it CABG, which is coronary artery bypass grafting, to AVR means aortic valve replacement, and TAVI is an endovascular procedure to replace the aortic valve, transcatheter aortic valve implantation, mostly done by cardiologists in the UK. But in the US and in Europe, some surgeons also do these procedures. You have mitral valve surgery and you also have congenital cardiac surgery. For thoracic surgery, it's mostly for lung cancer, lung volume reduction, tracheal surgeries, um, benign thoracic tumor surgery, and osophageal surgery. Unfortunately, osophageal surgery now is in the hands of the upper and IGI surgeons and no more under thoracic surgery, as it were. Then other areas are transplant surgery, which is combined between cardiac and thoracics, uh, trauma, and now the evolving minimally invasive and robotic surgeries, both in thoracic and in cardiac surgery. 
So I'll give you a brief description about what you expect to do as in the life of a cardiac thoracic training. So I'll just give you at least, this is a bit like a preamble before we talk about how to get into this training. It's a tedious life, the tedious specialty. Uh, I, I won't say it's for the best of the best, but it's the, in the screening process to get into training is quite tedious. Uh, there are two parts of this, this, this the whole process of cardiac thoracic training. It's one, to get into training, and it's two, after training, to secure a job. Uh, you don't have to be a trainee forever, so you want to get trained and secure a job. These are two different parts, and uh, I will discuss it further as we go on. So let's imagine you come in the morning to work. Uh, most times you have a team brief. Team brief is either done in theaters or in the IC, you doing handovers, where the like, night team discusses with the day team, or the day team discusses with the theater team what the plan for the day is. And most places you start by 7.30, some places start by 8 o'clock in the morning. So it's an early rise for everyone. Then you have the, if you're on call team, we do the IC rounds, so see the post operation from the day before and any other problems you have during the day. It's a quick round, it's a handover round, so you can even go about this business. And if you're in theaters, uh, knife on skin is try, try to get another skin as quick as possible. So from 8 o'clock, you're already getting the anesthetics, are putting lines in the patient. Uh, as, a, as a trainee, you're meant to be super ob observing these things being done. And uh, yeah, Times you have to be scoped on before intubation or ventilation. You have to make sure the patient is properly positioned and you make sure there's uh, the conduits, if you're going to do a graft like CABG, vein graft, the chest uh, limb harvest. If you're doing a valve, you check your valve sizes are okay. If you're doing an aortic procedure, you check if your conduits are appropriate for the procedure. Um, and the beginning of your training, you may understand what all this means, but you should show interest by reading before the procedure, come to theaters, and you're basically assisting your, your, your consultant or your senior training during the case, and that way you learn. Sadly, surgical specialties training is not by textbook, it's by apprenticeship. You learn by observation and you learn by trying your hands. And the day starts, and this is what it looks like in theater. Uh, a large team in cardiac surgery, never simple. You have a surgeon, an assistant, a person in the surgeon. Sometimes you have a second assistant who could be also a, a registrar or an SCP, which is surgical care practitioner. You have the scrub nurse, you have the anesthetist on the head and his assistant. You have a running team. Uh, you have a perfusionist managing the bypass system, and uh, which I will show you the bypass system. This perfusion is here. Imagine a bypass system. You also have an assistant who runs around for him if he needs something else. So it's quite a large team in theater doing the cases. Um, so knife on skin, open the chest. This is what you see in the heart. This is a completed procedure already. You can see an incision line here, possibly an aortic valve replacement here. Now this is what it looks like. The nice, beautiful case done. No much bleeding. Everything looks nice and clean. About to close up. Uh, these are tubes to drain the heart and turn the heart on this tube, get the blood plaque on the heart. So it's a cardio bypass instituted in this patient on bypass. The heart looks to be arrested here and still and empty, ready for surgery. And this is a case of coronary bypass grafting. If you look closely here, you see a vein graft being stitched onto the vessel on the heart, and that will treat the angina and chest pain this patient would have had. After surgery is done, well, it could be five o'clock, it could be earlier, it could be later. Uh, patient is shifted to the ICU, most times intubated. You can see this uh, uh, stack of devices or supporting drugs for the patient. And uh, go to intensive care, drains are in, and uh, wait for recovery. Other things you have to do as a registrar or as a trainee will be to take on calls. You have a device called a blip, troubles you all the time. It gets referrals from this bleep. It gets on calls referral from this delay from IC, from anywhere in the world, can I arrest to come to this bleep? And it alerts you that it's a problem. You see the number there and you rush down there to treat the problem. You have clinics once or twice a week. Uh, you have MDTs once or twice a week. You're also encouraged to be involved in research, audit, uh, educational programs, and being attempt to start to build yourself as a leader and gain management skills during your training. The training makes you to be a complete doctor. So you're not just a clinician or a surgeon in theater, but say a manager in the hospital, a researcher, 
and you're a leader in of your team. Now, what are the pathways to training? Uh, I would say for I think most of the audience are people who are who are of most of us are not are non UK citizens or not trained in the UK. So the pathways for training are basically I will call it three pathways according to the GMC. The first pathway is the national training pathway, where you get a national NTN number, the national training number, and you are in a formal training as a UK uh, registered trainee in cardiothoracic surgery. That's one pathway that will lead you to have a CCT. Uh, CCT means Certificate of Completion of Training. And with a CCT, your GMC register you as a specialist on the GMC specialist registrar. Uh, register. On that, once you're on that register, then you can apply for uh, consultant jobs and go for interviews and slog it out with all the other, other um, applicants and hopefully get a job and your life starts as a consultant. The other pathway is called the CESAR pathway, C-E-S-R. It's a certificate of uh, eligibility for specialist registration. Uh, this pathway is most times for people who have had training overseas in the specialty and do not require additional uh, training in, in that regard, as in the additional form of training. Uh, some of them may need an extra exposure to the UK system first, uh, get some exams done, and they, you, you, all you need to do at the end of the day is to mirror your portfolio with the portfolio of the national trainee. The syllabus is same, the requirements are same, but in this case, you're coming from not the front door, you're coming from that door. So you need to get you need to mirror yourself as a trainee who's been doing training for six, seven to eight years and submit the same evidence to the GMC to our such documents and say, okay, I think you are equal to our own final trainees. Quite straightforward. The EU before Brexit a few years ago. Uh, if you train in the EU system, you walk into the UK and you get automatic registration onto the register in the UK, and you can apply for jobs as a consultant. You don't do any exams, don't do anything else. You just apply, and they register you as a specialist. So I think it's the first training pathway, which is the national training pathway. Uh, this national training pathway, uh, this what I'm showing you is changing from next year, sadly. Now we have what we call the run through training. The run through training whereby you get screened into uh, a national selection program and you start your phase one training which is the first three years of junior training you do cardiothoracic exposures in the ward in the icu and theaters for the first three years uh that will be i'll put that as this for this one so you're able to see this one so that's this pathway in the first three years here you are from st1 here you're from applying here you get into st1 which is st1 st2 st3 that is specialist training one two three during that time, you're meant to do your MRCX examination, which is your membership exam for the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, during this time also, you are building a portfolio of cases. You are uh, cases mainly either surgical cases or case-based discussions or uh, or um, CSX, or called, um, when you examine patients for, in the ward, you get, you get signed up for small procedures, small interaction with patients and this assesses your progression in experience. At this point here, this is where you transition to phase two, where you're now a middle grade trainee, and now you get to do more in theaters, you're going to theaters more, you're doing more cases, you're handling more on calls now, um, you, you're doing on calls as a standalone registrar, uh, your night sheets in the ICU, chest will be opening, you're there, you're handling research, you're doing audit, you're presenting national conferences and international conferences. So you're beating yourself as a middle grade surgeon. And, and you get to this point here, this where you have now have to do your, you now be eligible for your, uh, which you call the FRCX exam, which is the exit exams for cardiothoracic surgery. Um, 
it, 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 it assesses you to be at the level, in quote, of a day one consultant uh, in the sense of decision making, uh, basic operative skill, and um, yeah, and if you pass that exam and you progress to the last two uh, years of your training, at that time you could now come down to either cardiac surgery or thoracic surgery, or you could branch out actually to congenital cardiac surgery if you so desire. After the, the completion of 70 years on this point, and you have what we, as national trainees, you have what we call yearly ARCPs. Uh, ARCP is, is where you assess your progression in the specialty. So every year you have a meeting at your dinnery and that's what you've done in the last one year. Say, okay, you've done well, you progress to the next year. You have a benchmark which you need to achieve before you progress to each year of your training. So at this point, if you pass your exams and you've done enough cases, you go to the ARCP and if you get the outcome, let's say, I think outcome six, you progress to you will later be sent to the GMC to certify you as completed of training, and the GMC will add you to the specialist register. Register. During this training program, uh, it's it you are eligible or encouraged to have, can go out of program. You can take out of program to do your masters, to do your MD, to do your PhD. Um, sometimes this actually helps to build your portfolio at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, when you're applying for a job, it's quite competitive. So you want to have the, all the um, available armor material before you finish your training. So people take their time out of training to do research, to do masters, and to do PhD. And the training time is extended, but you, you they know they don't understand you're doing this. Previously, training was eight years. So you've seen seven years here. Uh, training is going to change to seven years from next, from well, obviously from from the last from this August. From the new the curriculum that's come out, seven is now training years, but that will affect from next year. Uh, they tend to shorten training. Why? Uh, the out uh, the the GMC are looking at more outcome based um, kind of training instead of just duration. So it's about what you can do, not about time you've spent. So spending twenty years doing training does not make you does not make you particularly a, a better surgeon, but the quality of what you've done doing training things to be better. So they're using the time of training, but trying to make it hopefully more intense this time. Now the previous pathway, which I think would not, is I think it, it ends this August of this year. That was the last opportunity. Is the um, I'll call it the uncoupled training, as it's, as, as it's where. Now in this uncoupled training, um, you most people will not get ST1 training sometimes, so. When you finish your FY years and you get your crest signed forms, you can go into core surgical training, which is about two years. And that core surgical training depends on what specialty you can do general surgery, you can do cardiac surgery, you can do anything. It just gives that experience in a surgical specialty that will build your portfolio to apply for ST1. And then you can apply at ST1 here and you get into the go on through. So that's the critical point here. Also, previously, there was an ST3 entry point, which is, um, which was, which ended this August, the last selection for ST3 ended August 2022. Uh, ST3 was whereby you could be a foreigner coming in, because at ST1, you, you, you're meant to be quite junior to get into ST1. So most of the foreigners coming in here who have, who have been spent some time since medical school doing different training whatever is cardiac surgery or whatever training they've done uh you need to build your portfolio to submit for st3 application which is a bit very robust uh, you may have like 80 applicants for two posts that's how bad it is most times so it's quite very competitive and over the years they've reduced s3 s3 uh entry points and the last entry point was august last this year and i think from next year there wouldn't be availability for any st three positions it all ends at st1 uh, recently also they've added also an st4 entry point for thoracic surgery so if you want to branch out to purely thoracic surgery you could branch out at st4 however you would have been in training already 
as a ST training before you can branch out. So there's no entry point from outsiders to get into thoracic training as it were. Uh, however, we were encouraged to still apply and um, and slog it out with other candidates for these positions. It's new, so I'm sure it will be flexible for now um, before things may tighten up in the future. Uh, why it is happening now? Uh, because in the UK at the present, uh, most units are split into cardiac and thoracic, so you don't have a surgeon doing both. You have most of them either doing either cardiac or either thoracic, and they ask them, why do you have to train as cardiothoracic when you end up doing only cardiac or only thoracic? And then argument is gaining ground, and the way things are going in the future, we might have only pure to cardiac trainees and pure thoracic trainees. So I did, uh, most of these slides were from my colleagues that gave us, who are, who are trainees and gave me these slides, but I did some editing to uh, factor out the present situation of things. So for next year to XT1 application, uh, application will open in November uh, and close in December, and there'll be a shortlisting around January, and interviews will be done in February, and offers will come out day after. This is the timeline for the next year applications. Uh, I was, Talk about your what they expect of you when applying for ST1 application. I will stop sharing this slide and open a document to show you something. So can everyone see the slide? Yes, sir, we can. Good. So this is the percent specification for the 2022 application that had just passed. The present one coming up for next year is still being not yet published. So what you essentially should have, well, you should have MBBS or equivalent qualification. Uh, you must be eligible to have a full, to have full GMC registration and hold license to practice. You also must have completed a foundation year program uh, last is your housemanship or foundation program as they call it in the UK, and also have a 12 years, 12 month experience post GFC and what we call the crest form, the circuit of readiness to enter specialty training. So this is when you do your 12 month experience, you would get signed off by your trainers and this form will be signed that you have worked 12 months post GFC and you are fulfilling criteria to eligible for training. Uh, these are other simple things. You must be speaking English according to GMC, your ILTS and stuff. You must, fit, you must fit to parties with no indemnity issues. And during your your work experience, you should show that you are, there's good career progression. So you're not someone who have been poor, have a poor career progression, like you've been at, at one spot for the last five years. It tells bad on your progress. You want to be someone who is moving forward consistently over the years. Another thing we should put in highlighted that the, the more time you spend in the specialty, so imagine you've been in Nigeria as a as, as a furniture house job, and you work as a maybe as a registrar in a surgical department, or um, and you spent four years as a surgical department, you can do many surgical procedures on your own. And you look as if you feel you're good, yeah, I'm I'm good enough to get into training. Sometimes it tells bad on you when you spend too much time. So the more time you spend in, as a or as a doctor, a registrar in a department, the less scores you get in the in the scoring matrix for recruitment into training. 18 months is the best time. You spend 18 months, you get a maximum score. You spend less than 18 months, you get lower score. More than 18 months, you get lower score. So 18 months is what everybody aspires to do. So people will be in the UK trying to get their portfolio to apply for ST1 training. Now, to avoid breaching the 18 month rule, the smart thing you do is to take a clinical research job. So you be a clinical research fellow and you're working, doing your MD or doing research. So that way you're building your research portfolio. You're keeping an eye on the application for the specialty. And most research jobs are affiliated with hospitals. So you could actually have some also some clinical time whereby you have half clinical time and half research time, and you can use that half clinical time to build up your surgical exposure and cases you need to apply for ST1. So that was what people do. It's quite common to do also when you're doing ST3 uh, training too. Um, then uh, you mustn't have been in training before, or if you have been in training before, you must explain why you're coming back into training. 
and, and also you mustn't be eligible for CCT or CISA in any form. So if you have trained in Nigeria or anywhere in Africa or in Europe in maybe in cardiac surgery, I am coming to the UK to apply for training on ST1 level. Uh, this will tell badly on you because you've had training already in, in this specialty, you've had your that FWACs or whatever specialty qualification you have, and you're coming in to do training again and say, why? Because the idea of the training is to get people who are fresh into training, not people who are already done training somewhere before. So most times I've had senior colleagues who told me they've applied, they got the screen number, only to get to screen and tell them, sorry, we can't give you the job because you already have training before. So we don't, we cannot, we already did now, you just refresh what you have and fine tune your training to get on the register, not to train you afresh. Uh, okay. I will take us back and just briefly look at this quickly. Uh, personal skills, these are all things you just need to explain your management skills, your IT skills. They tend to like people who are also creative, which I will show you in some slides going forward. Uh, okay, I will stop sharing this now and go back to the presentation. Sorry for the going back and forth. Okay, so on this next slide, um, when you talk about the your clinical skills and not your expertise, there are courses which you should have before you apply for ST1. One of the is the business social skills, uh, your ATLS, and your CRISP, CRISP, uh, CRISP course. Uh, these courses that are available online on in-person courses, you need to attend them, have to apply for application, and it improves your quality of application. Um, then uh, academic prizes and stop publications, research, uh, these are things that sometimes you don't take this seriously, and um, they come to haunt you in the future. Now, this, this point, this gives points where many people will not have points in. Everybody will do BSS, everybody will do ATLS, everybody will do CRIPS course, everybody has MBBS, everybody has a nice write-up. Well, a few people will have prizes and awards or distinctions, uh, and you come out different from them when you have this and you have more points than them. And this could just be the only designing factor between candidate A and candidate B for application. So if you're a medical student, put your head down to and bag one of those prizes, it may come handy in future. As my friend wrote down here, said points win prizes, so you just have to do it. Now, this is the shortlisting criteria. This is how they score every application. Uh, this was for the last 2021, last 2022 candidates. So the scoring is from like zero to three. And the first thing about the employment history. So if you have a good career progression, you score a maximum of two points. Easy, right? Uh, and this is mostly your found your jobs you've done. So if you finish your uh, internship and you get a job in CTS, cardiac surgery, as maybe a SHO or even your foundation year in cardiac surgery, the, the month is four months to spend on rotation or the six months to spend SHO or more. And if that progression is good, that the first day you come, you cannot you cannot put a, you cannot do anything. Now you're putting chest strains. You know you're going to theater. You're investing in veins. This tell good on you. And um, yes, you get the scores you need. Uh, if you've had an accredited prizes or national awards, brilliant, you score three points, easy points. If you don't have it, you have zero points. So this is how things come about with prizes in research and audit you've had in on a graduate level. If you also have done electives, so if if you could be, if you're in Nigeria, you can go and do electives either in the country or outside the country, doing your quotations, you can spend four weeks electives in one center in the UK or in the United States, or Canada, or in you know, Australia, or New Zealand, uh, at least these first world countries, it gives you that good edge, and you can score the support, and okay, this, you're committed to cardiac surgery, uh, doing when you're in medical school, thinking about it. Also, if you have higher degrees, uh, MD, PhD, oh, wow, yeah, even better, it's got the highest point. And you wonder, why should someone apply for ST1 having PhDs and MDs? Uh, these are all criteria to screen people out. So if you come in with a PhD on MD before you apply for ST1, get the highest score, three scores. If you don't have any, you have zero. It looks very very mean, but that's that's it. Now, uh, also when you put at national society meetings, like we have the society called the SCTS, which is the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgeons in England and Ireland, in Great Britain and Ireland, 
we have national meetings every year and other meetings during the year. If you can come and present as makers in just meeting or I say chose and you get an award for the best presenter, brilliant. You can get a good scoring for your uh, application. Uh, then if you've had any other postgraduate diplomas, either in education or in, or in research or any other degree, uh, it's also add to your application, you score two points there. If you have been involved in research, national research, national audit, international research, you just get, you just get points there. And any prize or academic achievements you've had, best in this, best in that, um, you get points for these uh, awards. If you have any national oral presentation, so you had a submitted an abstract or an article for to a job to a site to a, to a meeting, national meeting, international meeting, and you present orally or a poster, you get scores for those things. If you've had some publications and you're the first author, second author, you get points based on your uh, involvement in the publication. Uh, so at least one national presentation. And if you're a first paper, first author in one and three papers in cultural surgery, it also scores you a good point. Audit is something we cannot, in the UK system, audit is like, it's everything. You must have done an audit. If you've done a closed, a closed loop audit, even better. Uh, what's a closed loop audit whereby you uh, you do an audit, or an audit is trying to find out your practice in your unit, comparing to the standard, the national standard or international standard. So if you find a problem you need that okay, my unit's not we're not getting achieving the national standard, and why is that you did an audit and you find that these are the factors affecting why you're not achieving national standard. Now these recommendations are now put in place, and you now do a re-audit after a time to see if with your accommodations, has there been any change to practice? And when you do a re-audit, that's closing the loop, you close the loop of the audit and it gets you better marks. If you've also held positions as a leader, so secretary, chairman, member of a, of a society group or um, you know, registry, uh, trainee group, foundation year group, anything hospital, uh, rotor coordinator, anything you've done that helps national level, international level, you score points on those things. If you're involved in sports, if you're designing, designing if you're designing arts and crafts, uh, so it just tests people's creativity apart from surgical and medicine. It also scores good points in uh, as a training into an application. And your logbook, so whatever you've done briefly also in, surg in surgical specialty also make you score points. Uh, so I'll put it this quickly to just show us uh, how training has been over the last couple of years. So uh, the, the, excuse me, so this is the blue line show people that applied for training. This was shortlisted and those have been appointed. Here is at the ST3 level. So initially ST3 level, we applied a lot. You have a lot of people coming at ST3 level and over the last few years it's drained down. At ST1 level, you see the, the, the bread which is appointed is increasing. And that's been a trend over the last couple of years to have more ST1 and a few ST3. Now, uh, this is what I know, but uh, it's yet to be confirmed. For next year, there will only, only be six slots in the whole country for ST1. There's no ST3 slots, and the ST4 slots are still being debated how many, what are numbers. So you can imagine only six people in the whole of the UK will be in, will enter into training in cardiac surgery. Uh, you wonder why it's a small number. The, the jobs are not really coming up in the future because uh, in the whole year in the UK, you may have only maybe five to 10 new content posts and you have up to 20 people finishing training as a trainees then you also have the other guys coming as caesar all applying for the same job so you have a job 40 applicants one job and that's how it's been trained for the last few years so it's quite difficult and the training committee are saying okay we cannot just be realistic we get too many trainees they don't get jobs they complain and they cry too much so what do we do we cut training down to be realistic the number we have of jobs that will be available at the time they finish their training uh so when you finish training before you can get into this register your clinical experience counts you should have done or be involved in as a major involvement in at least 250 major cardiac cases which will be avia big cases cabbage avia mitral valve repair and aortic surgeries 
you have done at least four pub publications, six international presentations, one loop audit, management courses, conferences, and also you have passed the FLCX exams. So uh, it takes a lot of years to get all this done. You could take out 15 years. Earliest people can get in nine years. So you're in medical school now, you're finishing your medical school, you're doing the FY1, starting your MLCS, you pass that, you're getting your training, spend one to seven years, and you're a consultant. Now, I'll quickly talk about the CESAR pathway, which is the other pathway where if you've had training before outside the country, you come to the UK, you're senior, you can go back to training again in the UK. This is the pathway for most people. This is the pathway I am also on to. So that's the title. Uh, that's what I just said. And you need to just demonstrate that you have the same qualification as a UK trained trainee. It's an unstructured pathway in the sense that in the, as a trainee, you get yearly ARCPs and people tell you, okay, you need to improve on this and improve on that. In this pathway, it's, you are on your own. You are, you are the driver, you drive yourself. So you have, you have to seek information on what you need, seek information on what to do, seek information on how to do. It's all in your hands. No one guides you, no one directs you. Uh, all, uh, last, in the last couple of years, they've been in, in doing some courses with some society to guide people on what, what information is necessary. It takes about, if you are come from outside Africa, South Africa, Middle East, it takes you at least a few years to get all your documents ready uh, before you can apply for this. Because Caesar, look at your last six years of experience, your current experience, I want to last six years on your application. So you still want to be a surgeon. If you have the guts, if you have the grit, yes, you can, and you go for it. Uh, so what do you need to do? Well, to need to achieve academic excellence, uh, try to get jobs in the psychiatric surgery, uh, see that placement of foundation jobs or um, electives. Uh, try and do some uh, audits or publications with your team. The more you do with people, the more you get publications. Uh, if you plan to do MLCS, get it done quickly. Without MLCS, you can be a registrar, even with CESA or uh, or training. MLCS is basically becoming a registrar if you write the FRCS. So you must do it for MLCS if you want to ever be a CAD surgeon in the UK. Uh, do the courses you need to do, based on the skills, case, ATLS and CRIPS, and do review this criteria for selection every year so you can know what you need to do and when you, where you were lacking in, what points you need to make so you can match up with everyone else. And well, be open minded. Not everyone will get into training, not everyone will be a surgeon. Not everyone will be a consultant. Recently, there have been new roles in the UK, what they call the SAS group, uh, staff grade doctors, whereby you're not a consultant, but you are a senior doctor in that department. You could have independent roles. Uh, these roles are trying to be, they're trying to create more of these roles so that they can accommodate most non trainees in those roles and leave the cotton jobs for their trainees. It's an ongoing discussion and I think there might be some future in that. And I'll leave this little few slides, just this is a site you can get information for uh, to know about some information you need. The most important site will be here, the national training website from the wessexhe.nhs.uk telling you about um, yeah, the, training, the training pathways every year, the equipment time, documents you require, and also, if you look at the keyword CESA information, you go to the uh, GMC website or the JCIE website to get more information about CESA and what it entails. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that was quite compact and well detailed. And I'm sure uh, people have a couple of questions. So if you can, access the comment section you can drop your questions so he can read them out okay. uh if i can just say some things to you guys um there are, there are two things you look at as I as I want to be into into cardiac surgery. The first thing is what is your desire? Is your desire to uh, get trained and uh, maybe go back to the country and work? Is your desire to train in the UK and stay back in the UK? 
and so they had to train the UK and go anywhere in the world to to get uh, to work as a surgeon. If you desire to come to the UK to get the experience as a cardiac surgeon, uh, experience means clinical experience, surgical experience, and come back to, to Nigeria to apply this experience. Easy. You get your MLC, get your MLC has done. Uh, apply for registrar jobs in the UK. You come into the UK, uh, work as a registrar, pick up surgical skills, and get your FLCS done. If you want to be on the register, you can pursue the CISA pathway. If you want to be on the register with your FLCS, go back to Nigeria. You have your skills already of work as a surgeon. If you want to stay back in the UK and, and slog it out to get quarter time jobs, why not? Come in here, get it, get the training, either go to CISA or apply for training number and you know push for it. Then if you want to train the UK and go and find jobs in Australia or New Zealand or Canada, these opportunities are bound because people they they everybody respects the UK. UK is a first world country. So you also get um reciprocal registrations with these other uh, countries. I'm seeing a question from Michael. Uh, Oh, okay. He just okay. I think I just said most of what he's trying to ask about other pathways you can exist here. So if you don't, if you see ST1, you're gonna be tough to get into the training ST1 level. You can get your MLCS, yes, come to the UK, pick up a registrar job in, in a good hospital. The main thing is get support. You can work in some in hospitals you don't have support. So you need to ask the right questions before you apply for jobs in different hospitals. Or as everyone does, your first job come in. Yeah, you see it's not very good, fine. But you settle in the UK, you settle into this into the specialty, you understand the politics in the specialty. You've got just always a a a, a, a I won't call it a rivalry. Yes, obviously I'll say the way it's just a rivalry between the trainees and non-trainees. The trainees feel they're entitled, it's our it's our right, it's our job. Non-trainees are look like who oh, are come from the back door, go and do the ward work. You need to fight for your slot in theaters because as surgeons it's what you can do with your hands no you can say with your mouth so you need to try and slow the time get time in theater to get to do operations and get confidence and get independent once you're independent get your exams done so you have that portfolio as an frcs red surgeon then you can go back and do chase whatever you want to chase you can go to the middle east to work you can go to anywhere in the world with your frcs and i'm sure you'll be expected I hope I answered you, Michael. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so uh, uh, one of the questions I got in my DM, um, someone is asking about the first question is about logbooks because you mentioned logbooks earlier. So the person would like yeah. to know, uh, because uh, personally I've heard about you coming with your Nigerian logbooks. However, sometimes they doubt your credibility. Of those logbooks, and I've heard about e logbooks also that some people yeah. use that are recognized. So I don't yeah. know what advice you can give in regards okay. to getting logbook, getting them signed, and uh, recording your procedures. Okay. On them. That was so, the first question. Yeah. Should I go with that first, or? Okay. So uh, for logbooks, uh, anything you've done anywhere in the world would be considered. Now, it's what about what is the weight of the evidence you're submitting and what is the weight of the consideration you know, given to that evidence? Nothing is disregarded. Everything is not noted, but everything has weight. It will be difficult to, to get ST1 training coming from Nigeria straightforward, apply from Nigeria without even coming to the UK before. I think that will be, it just be ambitious. You can apply, yes, fine, but it will be ambitious. They will find a way to push you out. They will always find a way. You, you, it, it has to make all the criteria from outside. So most people will have to be in the UK, spent, I spent some time in the UK working at different levels to get some UK experience added to their previous experience before they can apply for ST1 training. That is the best and obvious truth. So the e law book is free. It's available on the website, on, on the uh, World College website. You can download it. Uh, it's a logbook to log in all your procedures and it's in a format that's acceptable to the GMC and also the society and also the uh, application societies. So when you're applying for jobs or for training, and you, so you have a, your e-logbook, you can download it quite easily and the format where it is structured fits what they require as their standard logbooks. Some of us have come in here and added our previous cases we've done in Nigeria into the e-logbook. So they're doing retrospectively. 
And you can see in the e-log book, this AWOS will ask you, where, where do you do this? Where do you do the operate? You should it come to Nigeria. Some Nigerian centers actually online already because people have put them before. Some are not, so you just say Nigeria and, and, and they accept it. There are different countries also there. So e is the format they want you to submit your, doc, your evidence as. So it's a good thing to, 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 to use. Mm -hmm. and, and when you come in here, you also recall the ISCP, which is the uh, surgical portfolio. It's where every, every trainee some, uh, uploads their, put their evidence into the ISCP daily, weekly, monthly. So whatever you do, if you do a CBD, which is a case-based discussion, if you do if you, if you do a, uh, a, a a consent exercise, if you do a, a PDP, which is your progression, uh, developmental progression, which you do every year, if you do any research or prices, you can submit that evidence, upload it into the ISCP, and like a bank, keeping all the evidence there. And the ISCP can be easily linked to all the, 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 all the assessors, your, your GMC and everything, to assess what you've done. Also on the ISCP, when you do, let's say, imagine you do something on the world and you submit it to the ISCP to ask you that who assessed what you did. And you put the person's name and the person receives an email asking him to verify and, and assess this procedure or, or this uh, thing this gentleman has done. So I will assess that person and say, okay, yeah, he did it quite nicely. I will score him a two, a three or four, meaning, uh, it's not independent yet. It's getting better. It needs to improve on this. So I give you a feedback, and you can see how you progress from scoring it to to scoring a four, and that shows your progression over time. So for surgical trainees, e logbook and ISCP, uh, there's you, there's no there's no you cannot do without them. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, someone is asking for the link to the e book. I yeah, let me just get that online. Yeah, let me just check and pick that up quickly. So I'll just drop the link. There's a link there. You really start with your GMC number, I think that was the use. I think also use your email if possible. Okay, sir. Uh, the second question is in regards to the 18 months uh, benchmark you mentioned. Yeah. So uh so if someone is uh planning to get into cardiothoracic surgery training yeah. and you're in Nigeria, so the advice should it be that you should try and cut down on your surgical uh experience here. Or maybe if you're a medical officer, you've not got a residency. Should you avoid surgery postings uh, for a certain number of months or so? Yeah, so that's the thing. If you spend too much time in surgical specialty, you don't score the maximum mark. If you spend 18 months, you score the maximum mark. Now, what do you do when you're already working in that specialty and you're outside the country? Uh, you cannot lie in the applications. You have to be honest and truthful. So you 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 know you, you can you may not score maximum mark and you just score what you score. Also, if you are, if you are working in a, as a medical officer, not in surgical department yet, or and you want to do surgical, you want to do cardiac surgery, yes, and in Nigeria, it is nice to get some Nigerian experience. And the main thing is to if you're moving over to the UK, when you get to the UK, you have to focus on the jobs and the time you want to apply. So if you know, okay, my portfolio, I need to do these courses, and these courses will take me 12 months to these courses. And everything else you need as per the application to get the maximum marks will take you maybe 18 months. Within that 18 months, you make sure that I'm not working over the 18 months time in the UK as a register, as a in that specialty or a social specialty. So you can take a clinical research job, you can go and do a master's, so that day you're not working as a clinical, in the clinical specialty at that time, where, so that you don't go over that time and lose the maximum max. So if you have everything else already, uh, all you need is just time, the specialty, then fine. You come in, work for 12 months, and apply for a number. So what happens when you apply for a number the first time and you don't get the job? So you spend 18 months, apply for a number, think you get maximum score, and you're not shortlisted. Now, if you stay, keep working to next year, you become below 18 months, so now you have to triple like 24 months or more. So what happens then? So most people who have been here at 18 months, apply for a number, don't get a job. They tend to find a non, 
clinical job at that time and nobody do clinical research to go and do MDs. So you get clinical research job as a clinical research fellow. So your time for clinical work stops. So you maintain your 18 months. And in that time you're doing your clinical research, you've added more portfolio to your research experience, your audit experience. And if you get an MD in that time, so you understand you're applying for the, for the number again, your CV is better. That's what most people do. Okay, thank you, sir. It makes sense. Please, if you have any other question, you can drop it in the comment section, please. And then I just remember the particular question, sir. Uh, yes. Among the list of criteria you were mentioned in that uh, selection criteria, there's a particular section that had awards, prizes, research, or audit. Yeah. Uh, and then this thing, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's for you to have one of those that will make you score three, or you need to have all of them or what exactly? Uh, so. <sighs> If you let me come back up, let's well, see if you see what's going to So, uh, if you have an award in 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 the research, so maybe you submitted the publication and you got an award in the, in the presentation, go on. If you get an award also in your audit you've done, say this is the best audit in the trust you've done the audit, and say this is one of the best audits you've done in the department, or because you get an appreciation for that. All these are to different aspects of the application, which is that because okay, first you must have an audit. That is no debate. Audit is, is golden. Now, if you have a national prize in in, in university as an undergraduate, golden. If you have a national prize for oral presentation as a research, golden. And uh, if you have a best audit or whatever you do, and say, oh, this is the best, golden. The more you have, the better. So if you have one, fine, you get you get you get some score. But he has three of them. Obviously, it's, it's, there's no there's no gamble, it's no debate. It's 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 hugely competitive, hugely competitive. It's, it's so competitive. It's so competitive. That's the truth. I didn't do national training uh, in the UK. I did my training in Nigeria. I got my F work. So uh, I didn't even attempt once to try to apply for training because I knew. From what have, from people I've met before, I won't be able to be eligible for training because I've had training before. So all I have to do is to go into this Caesar pathway, build my portfolio, and submit to the GMC. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So if there are no further further questions, I'll be sharing the feedback form right away. Which will enable you get certificates for the um for the for this session. So I've shared it that I've shared it now. You can have access to it after you fill the feedback form. So sir, just for take away now, for someone that is post flap two and is looking to come into the UK, um would you advise uh, okay, yeah, of course, the person who, uh, can take maybe a catastrophic uh, post to just have a bit of an experience. But like you mentioned, if you apply the next uh, intake for ST1s and you miss out, uh, what are the options you have once you've missed out on one of those uh, application distant entries? Okay, uh, what I would say for everyone applying for uh, training or who, who desire to apply for training, coming in maybe not relatively fresh and young from medical school, I would say you can give it a maximum of three attempts, as I would say personally. Uh, obviously, the one attempt is not the first, most people don't get it the first time. So I would say give a maximum of three attempts and open your mind up. So if the first 12 months you're here, or you're coming here, try to Get your competencies all you need ready and submit an application within 12 months of our advice so if you don't get that application it doesn't work out well the next application will come in and you are already 24 months submit again 24 months will not give it 24 months in this class will not give you too many too much a bad score after 24 months you don't get it don't get a training number and your feedback from the 
failed application. It's not squeezed. You know your feedback and tell you what you didn't do or well, where you lose your marks. If it's nothing you can improve upon, fine. If there's no chance of improving upon whatever you're actually, where you're losing your marks from, then there are two options you can think about. Give it a go one more time, which I think will be your last chance. Or, and think about, do I want to understand specialty or do I want to do something else? You can do vascular surgery, you can do general surgery, that's what you can do in surgery, actually, to be honest. But if you want to stay back in specialty, then the only way you have to go is the Caesar pathway. But I'll tell everyone to, if you're coming to UK for, it, it, if you're a trainee, it's it's much easier life. So it's not easy life, but it's more easier pathway to get into CCT. Getting in is a problem. When you get in, most people get out if you do the right things. If you trouble someone, cause problems, and you're not picking up skills properly, then you will not finish your program. But it's very rare to put them to finish your program, quite rare. Most people finish the program at the end of the day. They're quite very supportive once you're a trainee. So it's just to get to it, to get into the program is what is very difficult. Once you get in, put your head down, know why you're here, you should achieve what you came for. OK, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and then lastly, I also I understand uh, as part of the selection process, there's like a minimum score uh, based on all those sele selection criteria you mentioned. Mm. So like there's a minimum score that one should score. So, for instance, if let's say it's over 60 and you're able to score maybe 33 and the minimum score is 30, uh, is there any significance between you that scored that 33 but have made it to the minimum score and someone that scores maybe 50? I think there's there's the there stage of the screening. So when there's when they when when there's when they open the application out, um you you have you have I don't think they, they disclose the scores to everyone. Everyone applies and you're scored. And the, the minimum score will be up. You need the maximum, maximum score. There's a minimum score for shortlisting. So once you, you pass a minimum score, you'll be shortlisted for an interview. Once you get to the interview stage, then they will trim down the list from those that cost a minimum score and they'll trim it down to the final candidates they want to take. Okay. But so will it still be based on that score? on that score, uh, the scoring from the criteria you mentioned um, the interview? I think the interview might take a more center stage at that at the second time to, to select whoever it, it, it applied. But <laughs> as we, uh, to be honest, the system tries to be fair, but we know nothing is ever fair. That's what the truth, we know nothing is ever fair. And uh, I could share paper to you guys, you can have a read later. Uh, you can see these are the, SAC, which are the senior guys in specialty who screen people, and they themselves know that there's bias in the system. Uh, people have very great support and references, and somehow they just come in and they get number. Uh, but there's a lot of bias, and <sighs> you just have to do your best. Do your best, try and get good support. And just, I'll say put prayers to it to God God for us. So, so, for, so some uh, his blessings to hear you through. It's, it's not easy, man. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very welcome. much, sir. So, um, in the absence of any other question at this moment, uh, we'll be uh, ending the session. However, remember that if you do not fill the feedback form, you would not be able to get a certificate. So, please just try to do that. And then, uh, fortunately, I still have. Uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin's contact. So in case you have any other further question, I'll be happy to relate it to him. So once again, thank you very much, sir, for taking your time to enlighten us on uh, what we need to do to pursue a CTSU training if we're interested in that. Uh, I hope and pray that God strength, uh, uh, straightens your path and give you heart wishes. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, that will be all for now, and I look forward to seeing uh, every, every one of us in the subsequent sessions we will have.